Uh, really pleased to welcome you to, to the third session, uh, which is called Climate Advocates, uh, the final uh, session of this conference, which is co-hosted by uh, the Institute of International uh, and European Affairs uh, and the French Embassy. Um, and I know many of you will have been listening in uh, all morning, um, and it's really been a, a terrific morning. I think a morning that has really brought out uh, some of the, the close uh, collaboration and, and potential uh, for further uh, collaboration uh, between, uh, between France and Ireland on, on climate issues. Uh, Minister Ryan and, and others have talked about the, the Celtic interconnector and, and, and other, other plans that we have together. Um, but also I think uh, as far as our session now is concerned, uh, the other sessions have been a really good entry point because they have time and time again gone back uh, to the fact that this is all about people. Um, and I think what we'll do uh, in this session is we will, we will deepen that a bit uh, uh, and we will also broaden it out uh, to, to a very global uh, perspective. Um, so I'll say a little bit about our uh, running order. Um, we're going to hear from three speakers. Uh, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland. Uh, Ina Moja, a musician, activist and land ambassador for the UN Convention uh, to Combat Desertification and Orla Murphy, uh, who is a university student and a representative of the winning uh, Climathon uh, team. Uh, so Mayor Robinson will open the session with a keynote address uh, on the importance of community-led initiatives for climate justice. Uh, following her remarks, we will have a brief uh, Q&A uh, with, with Mrs. Robinson, um, and then we'll go on to uh, Ina Moja's presentation about the Great Green Wall uh, initiative. Many people will be uh, familiar with this uh, project to combat uh, desertification and, and land degradation in the Sahel region of Africa, enormously uh, ambitious and an important uh, program. Um, and then Orla Murphy will deliver the final uh, presentation um, where she will outline what her team used to win the Climathon, uh, which is an uh, uh, initiative that addresses environmental transparency in the fast fashion uh, industry. Um, and then we'll have we'll have a Q and A with with Ina and, and with Orla after that. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you will be able to join the discussion with the Q and A function on Zoom, uh, which you'll see on your screen. Um, and I really encourage you to send in questions throughout the session because, as I said, we'll have two sets of, of Q and A. So it's never too early to ask your question. Um, and uh, please, when you do so, just identify your your name and also if you have an affiliation. Uh, please add that um, as well. Um, and just a reminder that the whole conference, including the Q&A, uh, is, is on the record today. Um, we'd also really love um, if you could join the, the discussion on Twitter, uh, and the hashtag is climate community. Um, now, it is my uh, great honor uh, uh, to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, definitely someone who needs no introduction, but uh, because talking about her Accomplishments uh, gives me great pride uh, and joy uh, as an Irish woman. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so uh, Mary Robinson is adjunct uh, professor for climate justice in Trinity College uh, Dublin and chair of the elders. Uh, she served as president of Ireland uh, from 1990 to 1997 and UN high commissioner for human rights from 1997 to 2002. Uh, she's a member of the Club of Madrid and the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, Freedom from then President Barack Obama. Uh, and between uh, 2013 and 2016, uh, Mary Robinson served as Special Envoy uh, to the UN Secretary General for uh, three roles. Uh, firstly, the three quite interconnected roles, I should say. Uh, firstly, the Great Lakes uh, region of uh, Africa. Uh, then on climate change leading up to the Paris Agreement, uh, and in 2016, uh, the special envoy for El Nino and also climate. Um, and Mrs. Robinson was Chancellor of the University of Dublin from 1998 to, to 2019. Um, she serves as a patron of the International uh, Science Council, uh, patron of the board of the uh, Institute of Human Rights and Business, and a board member of several uh, organizations, including the Mo Ibrahim uh, Foundation, and the Aurora Foundation. And recently, uh, she became honorary president uh, with the Africa Europe uh, Foundation. Uh, Mayor Robinson, uh, an inspiration to, to me and to so many of us, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sinead. If I'd known, I'd have said the shorter version, please. But <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to join and to take part in climate and community, le climat tous ensemble, 
because it's a very climate justice theme. And I'd like to thank the French ambassador and the IIEA for the invitation and also to congratulate them on the quality of the conference as a whole. Why is climate justice linked to community? It's very obvious. It's because it deals with the layers of injustice um, that require a climate justice approach. And I'll just run very briefly through those layers because uh, I think it's important that we ground uh, climate justice in uh, the reality of the many injustices. And the first is, of course, the injustice that the climate crisis impacts much more severely and earlier on the poorest countries, the poorest communities, the small island states, the indigenous peoples who are least responsible. And also, it's worth noting, these are the black and brown and indigenous peoples in our world. So there's a racial injustice there. And then secondly, the gender injustice, the different social roles, the different power, uh, the different rights even in some cases, such as land rights of women. So the gender inequalities um, that are uh, captured um, by the climate crisis and also uh, women being agents in their communities, trying to build more resilience despite uh, the difficulties. The third injustice is of course, the one that the young climate activists have been reminding of, of us over and over, the intergenerational injustice. And I'm so pleased that they are uh, direct and unequivocal and they're not happy and they don't think we're getting there and they're saying we have to do more. The fourth injustice is the more subtle one of the injustice of the different pathways to development of different regions. Uh, industrialized countries like Ireland, Europe, um, the United States, is that we built our economies on fossil fuel. Now our responsibility is to wean ourselves off and do it with just transition, like we're doing for peat workers in Ireland at the moment, who used to rely so much on board the moon. Um, we have to make sure that they and their communities feel part of the future, that they have the retraining, reskilling for the new jobs and the digital economy, the green economy um, that, that's, uh, that's coming. The fifth injustice is the, oh, sorry, before I go on the, the different pathways, but of course, developing countries also want to go green, but we haven't been showing the solidarity of sharing the investment the technology, the skills, the training. And it's a really acute issue now for developing countries, especially with COVID um, having uh, you know, increased their debt and caused huge health problems um, and uh, the lack of equitable access to vaccines, all of that. Um, so we have to really understand the need for much more solidarity. And the fifth injustice, of course, is the injustice of nature herself, the loss of biodiversity, the extinction of species. And I'm glad that we have two big conferences this year, COP15 in Kunming in China, um, where we uh, want to protect 30% of the land, 30% of the oceans, and have a whole new uh, approach um, to protecting biodiversity. And I'm glad there is a gender um, uh, plan now in, in that COP. And then of course, we're more familiar with COP26 um, in uh, Glasgow. And uh, I want to pose another question. Why is it so important that communities and frontline voices are heard in COPs? Uh, I saw that myself. I witnessed how important it was before Paris when I was, as Sinead has mentioned, uh, the special envoy of the Secretary General. I watched in the months before uh, we, the French presidency, organized uh, additional ministerial, uh, informal ministerial meetings. They were actually quite boring because um, the ministers tended to repeat their lines. But what we heard over and over again was Tony de Bruyne, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, saying, why don't you understand? Do you want my people to have no future? Do you want my islands to go under? Um, do you want us just to be... Um, you know, a, a, a displaced population in another country and lose the right to be a sovereign nature over and over again. And then we came to Paris and you saw the in the street, the uh, 1.5 to stay alive. We were all marching with indigenous civil society, etc. And then there was the high ambition coalition formed. Who was leading that? Tony de Brum, even though it included 
uh, the United States and the European Union. And what was the main focus to get 1.5 degrees into the text? And we got the new goal of staying well below two degrees, working for 1.5. And the climate conference had to ask the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to study this and explain. Because in a way, scientists had almost given up on 1.5 degrees. And when they studied, they saw that there is a very important difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, that in that time, very bad things can happen, like the Arctic ice can melt, the coral reefs can disappear, and the permafrost will probably melt and throw up not just carbon, but methane, which in the shorter term is even more lethal. So the scientists told us in October 2018, the whole world must stay at 1.5 degrees. And to do that, um, we must reduce by 45% our emissions how important that was. And we wouldn't have had it if it hadn't been for the frontline urgency of those voices and how Im impactful it is now. We see that the G7 for the first time with its environmental ministers and John Kerry was there and um, has aligned itself with 1.5. We see the importance of the International Energy Agency, which up to now has been pretty conservative, although it has a great um, executive um, uh, director, um, um, Fatih Birol. Um, but now, in its recent report, it too has aligned itself with 1.5. We see Shell being told in court, you have to reduce. Um, things are really shifting and the investment world is shifting. But what needs to happen is we need communities to somehow embrace the whole approach to climate, bottom up, own it. And, you know, I'm glad that at the European Union level, we have the European Climate Pact which is seeking to stimulate um, throughout the EU um, community-based approaches. So what we actually need is uh, in every county in Ireland, in every community in Ireland, a sense of ownership, a sense of driving this. And it will help to bridge what I believe is a false divide between uh, environmentalists and farmers. You know, farmers are being asked to do a lot. We have a new approach to the common agricultural policy. It's going to mean change. But farmers have always embraced biodiversity. They've always, because they know the importance of it, uh, tried to value um, the uh, importance of biodiversity. And we, we mustn't have any kind of false rift um, as we make a really important transition. And we can learn lessons from COVID. You know, COVID drove us all out of our comfort zone but it didn't do it equally. It actually exacerbated all of the inequalities like a mirror, and it brought out the intersectionality between those um, uh, inequalities. Intersectionality is a, a long word. It's a very feminist word. It really means the linkages. And so now we're seeing more of a link, and it's an important link in building momentum towards COP26 for urgency. We're seeing a link between Black Lives Matter, Me Too, um, the um, you know, gender equality campaigns and climate action, climate justice. And there are links because of the layers of injustice that I uh, began with. So COVID has taught us that, that you know, uh, we mustn't have these inequalities in our world. And I often say, I don't want to build back better. I actually want us to build forward with equality, justice and sustainability. And the positive lessons we can learn is that collective human behavior actually makes a difference. It's what's protecting us after all from the virus and um, while we wait for vaccines to be rolled out. Collective community behavior will matter. We need in this part of the world, the industrialized world, we need to take seriously um, the uh, su sustainable development goal on um, production and consumption. We need to realize that we have to be more careful. Uh, we need to uh, waste less. We need to recycle more carefully. We probably need to change our diet more than we're doing. And all of these are better if they're collective behavior. The second lesson from COVID is that government matters. And uh, we've seen the, um, uh, you know, the, the visible impact of bad government on the lives, on the health, and on the economy of countries. It's stark. It's very evident now, and historians, when they look at it, will really see how evident it is. We also um, know that science matters, something that the children, the climate activists, 
striking from school have said to us, listen to the science. As we come out of COVID, we must be listening to the climate scientists and taking very seriously. And the final point I wanted to make, Sinead, is that compassion matters. You know, we've seen it here in Ireland. We've seen a willingness to reach out and help those who are more um, affected. We've seen the concern about those in abusive households, those who lose their jobs. Um, but we haven't seen enough international solidarity with vaccines, as I mentioned earlier. We need, but it is moving in the right direction. So uh, I, I, I often say, and I want this to be more a community-based three steps now, we can all take three steps. And the first step is to make it personal in your life. So make it personal in your community. The second step is to get annoyed about those who aren't doing enough. And that's governments, but it's also business, investment, cities, and you know, put more pressure on them. And the third, and this is the most important that I want to end on, communities have to imagine this future that we need to be hurrying towards. It's going to be much healthier. It's going to have different kinds of jobs, but it's also going to be more nature-based. There's going to be um, an understanding that, uh, you know, look at Ireland. Um, we have such incredible nature in Ireland that can also help us in our future and in future jobs and future visitors, etc. So I get very excited when I talk about the potential of that future. And I'll end on that note um, because that's where communities can really help. Thank you so much, um, Mary. That was really uh, wonderful. And I think, um, you know, I think what you're telling us is that climate justice has to be the lens, you know, that there's many of us listening in today who are climate activists in, in, in different ways. Some of us are, are in business, some of us are in government and civil society, um, but climate justice has to be uh, um, the lens for, for all of our work. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do, uh, um, as you tell us so powerfully, but also it's the only thing that's going to work. And I think it was quite extraordinary last week. You were also involved in the Dublin uh, Climate Dialogues uh, when Fatih Birol, you know, was launching the the report and and the IEA of all organizations. Um, you know, it's it's, it's a hard headed, uh, you know, sort of energy uh, organization, uh, and they basically call time, uh, uh, as you said, on on the fossil fuel industry um so so it it, it is um it's what we need uh you know to to, to save this planet uh, as opposed to fundamentally uh being being just the right thing to do so so i mean uh, as far as uh, in my experience uh, you know you, you know if you didn't invent that term climate justice i think you certainly uh, um you certainly popularized it uh beyond anybody else and and, and i think as as ireland's climate envoy we certainly use it as our as our lens in government and uh, domestically as well as as internationally uh, by the way and Eamon ryan spoke a lot about that this morning and um, so so i think it's um yeah it, it's just it's just wonderful to you know to to, to have you uh, elaborate on that on that this morning um I see we have already uh, questions uh, coming in. Um, one of them is very uh, topical, um, which is I think it was yesterday that the um, that the the Dutch uh, um, uh, court uh, decision came out, and this actually came up in the last session as well, the the business session. Um, and I partly uh, uh, um, I, I partly mention it because there's quite a few questions here I can choose from. Um, because I know it's something you have been very involved in, obviously, with your legal background, and you've talked about it in your Mothers of Invention uh, podcast, uh, as, I, as I remember. Um, and I suppose that the, the question uh, here um, from uh, Ross uh, Fitzpatrick um, is, is how important is the role of climate litigation uh, in driving climate justice, and should fossil fuel executives be held accountable for crimes against humanity um, as one of uh, the world's leading climate scientist, James Hansen, uh, has has called for. Um, so um, maybe um, maybe I, I'll, I'll I'll let you answer that, um, uh, and then I'd come back to the next question. Okay. I, yeah, I I remember you know saying um, over a number of years, I do believe climate litigation is going to be more important. And then we got the first Dutch case. Um, and, uh, you know, and that seemed to be almost an isolated case. So it wasn't quite, but, you know, there was only the one. Now we're seeing so many important cases. We had the Irish constitutional case and we had um, a really very important case in Germany just recently where the German constitutional court has made it quite clear 
that Germany was not doing enough to protect its people. And the German Constitutional Court referenced specifically the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which was, you know, uh, as a treaty that was relevant to their decision. And that has electrified, I understand, Germany, which is very welcome. The French have had a case. Um, uh, and now this, uh, this Dutch case that you mentioned um, with the grandmother and, and, and young people, uh, sorry, the nun and, and, and young people, um, uh, you know, uh, I think we're going to see an intensification of litigation because we're able to measure more precisely what the impacts are. And so we know that there are only about, what, what is it, about 80 heavy emitters in the world. Uh, they better watch out because I think they're going to be picked off. We had the Shell case that I already uh, mentioned, um, and that's, uh, you know, a, a portent of, um, I, I think it may be more likely that there will be specific litigation against the worst emitters um, and also shareholder action is really becoming very important in Exxon and, and others, you know, um, uh, and the more of this, uh, the better, obviously. Um, I, I, I'm, and, and also there's a movement um, for a right to a healthy environment, which is a lot of countries um, supporting it. And I'm going to be speaking about that later today, actually, with the business community, uh, with the B team of business leaders. Um, uh, so I think, you know, um, a rights approach and litigation all of that is helping. Absolutely, and 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 as you say, linking the the, the personal to the institutional. Uh, you know, a lot of us are we're all voters. Many of us, uh, um, and and you know, many people are also are also shareholders, and and we're all consumers. So mm -hmm. so it, it is about making that link. Um, uh, the next question um, uh, is from uh, Oran Reed from uh, from Trinity um, uh, and also from IEA. Um, so delighted to see you speaking again at the IEA. Um, we all talk about a just transition, uh, and this encompasses all of your five injustices. So why are we so slow in the West at learning that climate action is now the biggest issue we all face, and that, uh, that returning back from COVID disruption and recessions does not mean recommencing unsustainable uh, development? Uh you know, it's, it's an interesting question, and I've, I've, I've thought about it quite a bit. And I've thought about it in terms of my own experience. You know, when I was president of Ireland, I didn't make any speech about climate change because we didn't experience it. I went on to be high commissioner. And there was another part of the UN dealing with it. It was when I started working in African countries for my small NGO called Realizing Rights. And I heard the direct voice. We don't know what's happening. Is God punishing us? This is un outside our experience. How come we don't have rainy seasons like we used to have? How come we have long periods of drought followed by flash flooding, et cetera, et cetera? Um, we are beginning to feel the impacts um, where we know we're going to get more precipitation, as the scientists call it, which means heavy rain. We're going to get more rain. We're going to get more flooding in Ireland. We need to be um, more alert to dealing with that. Our summers may get hotter, but the, 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 the rain and flooding will be the main a problem and maybe the odd hurricane uh, which we didn't have in the past um, uh, but you know um, I, I think we do need um, to uh, to actually be more in touch which is why it's very important that you have on this panel a, you know discussion about the green wall and that um, uh, you know Ina will uh, bring home um, the existential life she is living because she's living where that's that's the way it is um, but we're seeing fires in California, fires in Australia, you know, huge flooding in Texas and so on. Um, it's beginning, uh, but, you know, uh, we need to be ahead of um, waiting for it to get so bad um, that we feel we have to act. We have to be intelligent enough. But, but that is why we need the frontline voices at the COP. And I do worry, I meant to make this point and I don't think I did. I worry about COP26 because of the lack of equitable access to vaccines. How are we going to have participation? of the right voices in numbers that really matter if they can't travel because uh, of the health situation at home. Absolutely, that's a, that's a huge concern of ours um, uh, and actually something that, that we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, you have to dash for all of your uh, other commitments today, uh, but you've, I think, given us a wonderful opportunity to pass the baton to, to Ina Moja. Um, so just to really uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mary Robinson, for, uh, as always, uh, an inspirational and hopeful uh, message. And, um, you know, I, I know we'll have, we'll have a great, great follow-ups from, from Ina and, and, uh, and, and from Orla. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Sinead. I wish I could stay, but um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm booked. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll, I'll follow online. <laughs> okay, later. Thank you so okay. much. Um, wonderful. And, and as I said, a great segue uh, to, um, to Ina Moja. Um, uh, Ina is a Malian uh, singer, songwriter, actress, advocate for women and girls' rights, and climate activist. Um, she is a land ambassador uh, for the UN uh, Convention to Combat uh, Desertification. Um, she has also taken a leadership role uh, in the Great Green Wall uh, Initiative, uh, which is a project to combat uh, desertification uh, by planting a wall of trees uh, stretching horizontally across the entire Sahel region. Um, Ina has been a strong uh, supporter of efforts to combat uh, female genital mutilation um, as a personal uh, survivor of this ordeal. Um, her energy and her humanity uh, reverberate throughout her, her music uh, and her artistic uh, expression. And today uh, she'll speak to us uh, about uh, the topic of land uh, degradation uh, across the Sahel uh, in Africa. Ina, it's so, um, so wonderful to have the opportunity uh, to talk to you, uh, and I know you're putting into practice uh, some of what Mary Robinson has, has spoken about. So over to you, Ina. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really an honor for me to speak on this panel this morning and to tell you more about the Great Green Wall. The Great Green Wall is actually an African-led uh, movement. It's an initiative that started in 2007, and the idea is to build a wall from west to east all along Africa, uh, 8,000 kilometers of green, and in the region of the Sahel. And the Sahel is south of the Sahara. And as the desert is growing and the land are getting uh, drier, this initiative can really uh, help restore degraded lands and help communities combat the, the many, many issues that are tied to our change in climate. So for me, uh, uh, starting on this project, I started working on this five years ago, and it was very important to go on the ground to meet the rural communities who are uh, the first to face the negative impact of uh, climate change and also the ones who are doing the work to uh, make this Great Green Wall happen. So it's been a uh, past a decade and uh, we've roughly uh, achieved 15% of the Great Green Wall, but from um, now to 2030, the goal is to complete this Great Green Wall. And uh, also on the ground, having women being the leaders of these projects in every community that I've been, uh, women are really, really present and doing the work. And so for me, it was really important to, as a, as a feminist and as a women and girls rights activist and also climate activists, to be uh, to witness what they are doing and also to share their voices, share the work that they have been doing and how important the Great Green Wall will be once it will be achieved because it's something that is going to help uh, the continent of Africa, but it's also going to benefit the whole world because with uh, millions of actors growing, it's going in the end to be along for the planet also, like the Amazon is in different forests. So also to mention that the Great Green Wall is not just about planting trees, it's also about helping communities uh, learning new skills and also bringing job opportunities and also working on food security that is really important. And hopefully the Great Green Wall will be able to answer different uh, issues that are tied to it, like forced migration, like famine, like uh, conflict, drought that we see in the region of the Sahel. Uh, we, we, we have seen a lot of people coming from uh, this region trying to come to uh, what we think is the El Dorado, which is Europe. And uh, the fact that they are not able to make a living in the areas where they were born is a huge factor. And having also uh, all these conflicts that are happening in the region of the Sahel, as when we look at the lack chat that in 50 years has receded 90%. And when we see that the lack chat is actually um, around four countries, Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, and Chad, 
And all around that re the region where the lake is, there is this armed group called Boko Haram who are terrorizing communities there. That the communities have become very vulnerable because 80% of them live on some form or another of agriculture and uh, they're not able to make a living anymore. So uh, they've become very, very vulnerable. So the aim of this Great Green Wall is really to answer all the different issues that we are facing today. And for me, it's truly an honor to be part of uh, such an epic and ambitious project because I was born and raised in Mali. And as a daughter of the Sahel, I really want my continent to thrive. I want uh, the new generation to have uh, opportunities and a future because a lot of people say that Africa is the future. Uh, Africa is going to double its population very soon. So we want uh, to give hope to young people. We want them, we, it's actually something that can be really bad if we don't do anything. We're going straight into a wall that we are seeing right now, or it's something that we can work on right now and in 20 years be able to have a community that is really thriving instead of surviving. So for me, as a, as a woman, as a mother, as, a, as an African, it's really important, but also to bring the stories to the stage of the world so people can understand more why Africa is dealing and how Africa is dealing with climate change and the solutions that we are trying to bring and have people from all around the world be part of this movement because the Great Green Wall, if it becomes a movement, it will actually uh, give hope to other people on other continents to uh, replicate what we are doing right now in their communities. And it's really, it's about the people and uh, climate and communities. It's not just about uh, the drought, it's about the impact that it's having on, on, on people. So I think community are the one who are going to really save the planet because they are going to change the world by doing what they are doing right now. You know, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, you're just reminding me, I saw, I saw something on, on Twitter recently. I think uh, Elon Musk or, or some, one of the billionaires uh, launched a competition and asked, you know, uh, there was some multi-million dollar prize for the best technology for carbon mitigation. And somebody on Twitter posted a, a picture of a tree and he said, did I win? Um, I think, uh, I think there's, there's, a huge amount, uh, there's a huge amount in that. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why the Great Green Wall uh, initiative is so compelling because uh, it is, you know, very much about about mitigation. But as you said, you know, which is of course a, a global a global priority for all of us. But it's also, as you say, very much about about the community and and the individual level as, as we keep as we keep coming back to um, today. So thank you so much for for that. And and I know there's already some questions for you coming in. So we, we'll come back to that in in, in a second. And um, uh, but but we'll go to our final speaker first, and then we'll we'll come back to to questions for both of you. Um, our, our final speaker uh, of this session and indeed of this conference is uh, Orla Murphy. Um, Orla is a representative of uh, the winning team of the uh, InterVarsity uh, Climathon uh, competition, which, as we know, was organised by the French Embassy in Ireland. Uh, Orla is a university student, um, and she'll talk about the the project entitled Know Your Label, uh, which aims to tackle uh, transparency in the fast fashion industry uh, based on uh, SDG 12, uh, 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 responsible consumption uh, and production. Um, and I think, Orla, you're going to have some slides to show us the app uh, where consumers can, can get more information uh, about the, the product. So again, coming back to, to what we keep saying uh, over this whole morning, it's, it's also linking, linking to, the very, to the very personal. So really looking forward to hearing from you, um, Orla. Yes, thanks very much, Sinead. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Sinead mentioned, my name is Orla Murphy, and I am the chairperson of Know Your Label, the winning team of the 2021 Inter-University Climathon. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to share our project with you all. To give you some background, the Climathon was organized by National University of Ireland Galway and the French Embassy in Ireland. We were assigned into a team of four, and met twice per week throughout the month of March to first identify a problem related to climate change and then provide a solution. 
At the end of the month, we presented our project to a panel of judges alongside six other teams, and we were chosen as the winners. My team are based in three different universities in two countries, and having never worked together before, we dove headfirst into the project alongside our studies. So now I'd like to show you a presentation to give you a better insight into our project. Great, so today I'll talk about some background, the problem we identified, and our solution to this problem called Know Your Label. And before we go any further, let's meet the team. So Liz Hunt is our marketing officer. Liz is a third year social science student at National University of Ireland Galway and co-founder and editor of the university's sustainable fashion magazine. Then there's myself, Orla Murphy. I'm the chairperson, as I mentioned, and I'm a third year global business and French student at Dublin City University. I'm currently completing two years of study abroad at Neoma Business School in France. Harry King is our secretary and Harry is a third year global commerce student at NUIG and he writes for the student newspaper. Finally, Evan Manny is our technology officer and Evan is a third year actuarial science student at UCD, currently completing an internship. So moving on to give you guys some background. Our project, Know Your Label, focuses primarily on UN Sustainable Development Goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. Specifically, we decided to focus on the fast fashion industry, which can be defined as the mass production and consumption of cheap clothes in response to consumer trends. So why should this industry change anyways? The negative environmental impacts of the fashion industry are well documented. Currently, it produces 10% of all humanity's carbon emissions. On top of this, clothing production has roughly doubled since the year 2000. In recent years, however, there has been a growth of online platforms selling, used and, exchange, sorry, selling and exchanging used clothing such as Depop, Vinted, and New Wardrobe. This demonstrates the growing will amongst consumers to put their money towards more sustainable practices. Next slide, thank you. However, there is still a gap in transparency. One organization that tries to combat this gap is Fashion Revolution. They publish an annual report on the top 250 fashion retailers called the Fashion Transparency Index. The index is a tool to incentivize brands to be more transparent and to disclose more information about their policies, practices, and supply chain. Now, while transparency does not necessarily equal sustainability, initiatives such as the index help to push accountability among retailers. The average transparency score in 2020 was 23%, with some businesses scoring shock a shocking 0%. This shows that there is a lot of room for improvement. An anomaly with this transparency index is that it focuses only on transparency of communications from a company, and not the sustainability of their practices. They also run, Fashion Revolution also run social media campaigns such as hashtag what's in my clothes, as you can see on the bottom right, which is a publicity campaign to motivate industry and government to pay attention to the veracity of labeling. There's a common misconception that fast fashion is only relevant to cheap clothes. However, it encompasses both high street and high fashion. So moving on to the problem. Our team identified the following problem. The lack of easily accessible information for consumers contributes to the lack of transparency across the fashion industry. Tools such as the Transparency Index are great, but it takes much research to find out this information, and so it's not necessarily accessible. Now, lack of transparency is something we look at from three different perspectives. Firstly, from a consumer perspective. The average consumer is purchasing more, in part due to the influence of social media and influencer culture. Most of the time, these consumers are unaware of the negative impact that their purchases can have because it's not disclosed to them in a meaningful way. Transparency is also an issue when dealing with fast fashion companies. Metrics for measuring sustainability often differ from company to company, which makes it all the more difficult for consumers who are motivated to make conscious choices. Finally, policies across the world vary considerably and are often not legally binding. So while there are indeed steps being taken, the fast fashion industry remains difficult to navigate. So that's where our solution comes in. Know Your Label is a labeling system and app designed to create awareness for consumers about where their clothes come from. The label is designed with three metrics in mind, kilometers traveled, water consumed, and energy used. Take for example, a pair of jeans. The label would tell the consumer how far the jeans traveled, how much water was used to make them, and how much energy was used to produce them. The percentages relate to the industry average. 
a high percentage in red indicates that the metric is above the industry average, while a low percentage in green indicates being below the industry average. Accompanying the label would be a small QR code leading to an app with further and more detailed information. Moving on to our inspiration for the project. We took inspiration from the food packaging industry. People know everything about what goes into their food, so why don't we know the same for our clothes? The widely adopted BER system for classifying the energy rating of houses also uses a similar traffic light approach. So now I'll show you some screenshots from our prototype app. The home screen of the app, as you can see here, shows, um, um, sorry, the, on this screen, you'll see a mock-up of the label. When scanning an item of clothing in the store, the user will be brought to this screen that you can see here. And moving on to the home screen of the app, on the left-hand side here, shows you friends' activities and featured outfits. We wanted to bring a social aspect to the app with this, especially for younger users. Now on the right-hand side, you can see the information for the item of clothing that you've scanned. In this case, for example, a pair of H&M jeans. You have the option to add this to your wardrobe. And at the bottom of the screen, you can compare the jeans with other similar products to see if they are more or less sustainable based on our metrics. Please note that the figures are for demonstration purposes only. And moving on to the next screen, on the left-hand side, you can see your own personal profile. It's possible to follow your friends on the app and compare profiles. Each user also gets a personal wardrobe rating. This could bring out the competitive side of people in a good way and encourage them to be more sustainable. Finally, on the right-hand side, there is more information about the metrics used in the app for people who want to learn more about it. Thanks very much for listening, and I hope you guys enjoyed listening. If you'd like to get in contact, there's our project email address. Orla, thank you so much. Um, I have to say, I am dying to get this on on my phone. Uh, I think it's it's um, you know it, I don't know if, if if I get the expression right, but that that notion of transparency is the best disinfectant, and that often just giving. Uh, the power uh, to, to individuals to make decisions um, can really force the whole chain uh, to make uh, adjustments. So I, I think this is wonderful. Uh, I, I would certainly be emailing you to, to find out, uh, to find out uh, how we can download it. And, and uh, I'm sure you will have heard uh, Decathlon speak uh, in the last session. And uh, I think uh, they, they, they would be open ears for this because they had some wonderful examples of, of making fleeces out of, of plastic bottles and so on. So, so uh, I think they would, they would be very keen to, uh, to talk to you, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah, I think just wonderful, practical, tangible, uh, um, you know, technology. And uh, yeah, really, really look forward to this being, uh, to this being scaled up. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, so I, I'll start maybe with, with some of the questions uh, for, uh, for Ina. Um, we, have, um, we have about, uh, about 15 minutes, uh, I think, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So we, we'll hopefully squeeze in a, a few of the questions. Um, Ina, maybe uh, a first question for you. Um, you highlighted that the Great Green Wall not only provides a lung uh, for the planet, but will also lead to job creation for communities. Uh, you also mentioned political instability in the region. Uh, in what way has this uh, instability impacted the cross-continental wall uh, and how might it inform uh, the work uh, over the next 10 years? Uh, and this is a question from uh, Pauline Conway, who is a student uh, of the MSc in Climate Change at uh, DCU. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. Actually, each country is working on the, the Great Green Wall. And um, uh, what I could see from tra traveling from Senegal to Ethiopia all along the wall, what I saw is that all the countries are not on the same level of um, achievement on the wall. And it's also tied to the fact that some countries like Mali, where I come from, uh, ha are very unstable politically. And we have, um, uh, since 2011, we have a lot of terrorism in the region of the north where the Great Green Wall was supposed to start. And uh, so it wasn't until recently that it was an urgency. So we can see from a country to another that um, there, there are some um, 
inequalities on that side. But I think that what we are trying to do is to have everybody on the same level of engagement and uh, all the leading parties really involved in the project and making it their priority and uh, to have something that is more homogene than uh, because in Senegal and in Ethiopia, what I saw with my own eyes are really tremendous. Um, how do you say? I'm thinking in French right now, uh, are tremendous efforts that uh, have real results. And in Mali, nothing has grown from, uh, from, from the project. So this is something that is uh, a priority for us on the Great Green Ball project to, to bring everybody together. But there are other issues like COVID that really took us a step back and uh, we're working on it right now. But uh, now that we have more fundings to uh, achieve the projects, this is something, questions that are on the table and are being dealt with. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ina. Um, loads of questions, so I'll, I'll try to go uh, quickly. Uh, one question from uh, Viv Malone for you, Orla. Um, she's wondering uh, whether the project looked at the issue of plastic microfibers in clothes. Yeah, so when we were going through the project, we wanted to pick metrics that were most relevant to people that kind of made the most sense when you would see them on a piece of clothing. So those for that reason, we went for um, the energy used, the kilometers traveled and the water consumption. Now that said, um, if we were to continue with the label, we're still in the preliminary stages. Looking at the composition of clothes would definitely be something that we would consider because microfibers are definitely becoming more and more common, unfortunately, and it's becoming known that they are big pollutants in terms of fashion also. Um, so we haven't looked at it, but it's definitely something that we would consider for the future. Thanks, Orla. And I noticed there's a, there's a question that, uh, th there's a question from each of you about water. So uh, I, might, uh, I, I, I might ask each of you, of course it has slightly different, um, connotations. Um, so Ina, the, the question uh, for you on, on water from, from Pauline Conway from DCU is uh, given the increased presence of drought uh, in the region, as you highlighted, um, how do you manage water supply issues uh, necessary for the Great Green Wall? Um, and then for you, Orla, after that, um, Andrew Gilmore uh, from IEA asks a question. Uh, I noticed that you are measuring the water consumption uh, in the application of course, the fashion industry is the second most water intensive industry. Uh, did you find uh, when working on the project that this was widely uh, understood? So I, I might uh, start you know, with your water question and then move on to you, Orla. Water in the region of the Sahel is one of the biggest problems, the lack of water. And uh, to have women and children uh, walking kilometers to go and get water instead of being in school or working to make a living. And uh, for the Great Green Wall, that is also one of the, the, the skills that they are working to develop community-based solutions and local solutions to keep the rainwaters. Uh, and I saw in Ethiopia, in the region of Tigray, where they had uh, uh, the biggest famine in Ethiopia, how they conserve the water, the rainwater, and reuse it. They created a whole uh, way based on uh, local techniques. And uh, it's really the most difficult thing. That's the reason why uh, working on restoring degraded lands and regreening this region to help uh, you know, prevent the drought, it is very difficult. It's something that uh, we will be working on for a long time. And me as a, a musician and an activist, I don't really have an answer for that, but what I know is that it's a priority for the Great Green Wall project. No, thanks, Ina. Um, Orla, um, could we come to you on the, the question of, of whether the, the water uh, um, in, in intensiveness of the fashion industry is widely understood? Yeah, I think it's something that people definitely need more understanding of. For example, to produce one cotton t-shirt can take up to 2,700 litres of water. And really, I think that people, the average consumer when going into the high street shops, 
you know, we pick up a T-shirt and we buy it and we don't, it doesn't really cross our minds for another second. Um, so I guess that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with the label is to make people stop at the point of sale and say, oh, actually, can I do better than this? Is this something that I really need? Um, and really, we hope that like we're, we're trying to encourage people to purchase less and to look more at the actual impact of what they're what they're purchasing, including the water consumption. Um, thanks, Orla. I, I noticed as well, as you will have uh, even even more so that uh, during COVID, there was quite um, uh, there, there's been quite a maybe publicization of a lot of the the upcycling initiatives and and you know really avoiding um, you know avoiding this uh, you know just just throwing out uh, of the clothes. And I think your you know the way in which your um, making it clear how much indeed energy is going into our clothes. I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, that's a stunning, and that's a stunning statistic. Um, so, so I think, I think your initiative will have implications beyond, and of course, you know this very well, but it will have implications beyond its immediate use because people will just be generally getting more aware and then maybe saying, well, do I really need to throw this out or can I make an effort to you know, change it into something else or give it to someone else or give it to a charity shop and so on. So, so yeah, it's just, it's just so powerful. Um, a, a question for both of you, uh, a little bit uh, broader from uh, Dervila Cook, who's a lecturer in, uh, in DCU. Um, Dervila asks, is there sometimes a need for another term other than climate change uh, to talk about the ecological chaos in the world? Uh, for example, uh, COVID, a zoonotic disease, is more caused by destruction of habitat uh, fueled by consumerism than by climate change. Uh, this destruction of habitat and of buffer zones uh, between wilderness and human habitations and factories uh, can then exacerbate climate change, but the link is not immediately apparent uh, to the person uh, on the street. Uh, so in public discourse, it would be more helpful to make the link between consumerism, materialism, and COVID more apparent uh, if more specific terms were, were being used. And, uh, and just to say, I suppose from my own personal experience, I spent uh, I spent about two and a half years working on the Ebola crisis in, in West Africa, which we know was very uh, directly uh, linked to, to the destruction of habitat and, and, and the forests. Uh, uh, in a, coming back to your, uh, your presentation, um, you know, the, the destruction of the forest. So this this question is quite close to, to my heart. So, so maybe I could hear from uh, maybe Ina first and, and then Orla as to whether or not our terminology um, uh, needs to shift sometimes to, um, to make it more, um, you know, to make it more accurate and more useful when we're trying to communicate about these issues. I absolutely agree 100%. I think it's really important to because climate change is a big umbrella but uh, if we really uh, use specific terms that will help us really focus on the problem and find real solution for every problem and uh, i think that it, it is something that is going to happen more and more as people get more educated about it because now because of the media and everything that's been happening in the eye of, of the media, the public knows more about climate change in general. But it's really important that we stay, we make a step forward in really pointing out everything specifically to be able to tackle it as precisely as possible. So this is something that I myself try to do uh, on the Great Green Wall project or other project that we're, we're working on. As we've been doing for uh, feminism and women and girls' rights, it's really important to be really precise because every experience is difficult and every problem has to have a, a clear solution for that problem and not just put everything under uh, the same big umbrella. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I, I, I think that's um, I think that's very uh, very valid. It, it it reminds me of of all the surveys that have been done, where um, you know if you talk about you know one individual being affected by a disaster or three individuals versus if you start talking about thousands and so on, generally on average we we kind of switch off at a certain point. Um, you know when things become too too generalized. So so I think that's very valid. Um, Orla, would you like to add in on that? Yeah, I completely agree with um, what yourself and Inna have said. I think sometimes the term climate change, it's become so used that 
we just kind of disconnect from what it actually means and the consequences which are so um, devastating that we're that are already being experienced and I think that definitely talking to people and encouraging solutions is the best way to overcome that kind of disconnect and to um, try and make sure that the conversation stays relevant to people and that they fully understand what's coming down the tracks. But yeah. Thanks, Orla. And uh, we, we could easily stay here all day and, and questions keep flowing in, but I'm going to make this the, the last question uh, and it's for uh, Ina and it's from Dara Moriarty. Um, so Dara asks, um, you heard Mary Robinson discuss vaccine access and the impact that this will have on African small island presence at COP. Uh, do you believe the West is in danger of not listening to those most impacted uh, on the front line of climate um, devastation? Ina? I think that it's very important that we have equality into getting the vaccines because uh, we are living on the same planet. We are on the same boat. And if we don't get, if we don't manage to have everybody uh, have a, you know, easy access to the vaccine, the the virus will stay here because with globalization people travel and uh, it's something that is uh, really important and it shows how things have been going for decades and the continent of Africa and the poorest countries need to have the same access as the West has right now because otherwise it's going to just we we'll, we will keep on going in circles and uh, we won't uh, be able to, to tackle the problem of COVID. And uh, hopefully this is something that will happen. But uh, for now, it's uh, the number of people who have been vaccinated on the continent it's, is so low that it's, it's scary. No, I, I absolutely. And, and I, I think as, as, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I wanted to touch on that because it's such an important priority for for Ireland when it comes to COP26, uh, as I'm sure also for, for France. Um, in Ireland, uh, and not least uh, because of the activism of, of Mary Robinson, um, we've really put uh, small island development states um, and least developed countries, you know, right at the heart of, of what we do internationally on, on climate action. Um, and uh, part of that is, is precisely this issue of voice. Uh, and, and whose voices are, are listened to in international negotiations. And we're really concerned, um, you know, about, you know, a possible disadvantage um, at COP if, if, we don't, um, if we don't have the people who are the most affected by, by climate change actually um, in the room. Um, and Stefan, in, in the first session, you know, uh, elaborated a little bit on, on, on the priorities uh, for COP. Uh, I think what I would add to that for, from an Irish perspective, um, we, we, we absolutely, as Stefan said, we, we, we need to reach that, um, that financing goal, that, that 100 billion. Uh, but there's also uh, another goal on specifically on adaptation uh, and, and the kind of, of work that, that um, you know, is going on in, in countries like Mali and in the Sahel and so on, you know, helping people to adapt to the existing impacts of, of climate change, uh, you know, which is, is so incredibly real. Uh, um, for, for so many people. Um, so the global goal on adaptation is another really important area where we need to see uh, uh, progress uh, in, in COP. Um, the other issue that I just wanted to mention is around the oceans. The oceans doesn't really tend to come up in, in the climate uh, COPs so much. Um, and it came up, I think, in the first session as well. It's obviously a big deal for, for Ireland, um, uh, but uh, it's, it's something that I think we'd like to see more formally, uh, more formally at, at, at COP, not least because of these coastal communities um, that that are that needed to be supported for uh, for adaptation. And um, so for us, uh, those those are a couple of the key uh, issues. Um, and as I said earlier, also just just infused by this by this uh, climate justice lens, which I think our, our speakers this morning have have spoken about so um, so powerfully. Um, we, we, we're out of time. Uh, um, it's been a wonderful session. I really want to thank uh, um, I really want to thank Orla and, and Ina um, for uh, incredibly powerful uh, um, and practical and tangible uh, presentations uh, that are solutions that are solution based, uh, which which I think is, is exactly what we need. Uh, so uh, um, this this le climat tous ensemble. Um, 
uh, uh, final session, I think, has, has really reinforced to us uh, the importance of, of getting to that community level and, and community uh, engagement in this, uh, in this crisis. So, merci beaucoup à tous uh, pour, pour toute la richesse uh, qu'on a vu aujourd'hui. Uh, and I'd like to just invite uh, Michael Collins, uh, Director General of the IEA, uh, to, to close the conference. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sinead, and uh, congratulations on your appointment as uh, Climate Ambassador, and good luck with, the, with, with your work in that respect. And may I thank all the, uh, the speakers who participated in this morning's conference uh, for their insightful contributions. And I would like to also extend a particular uh, word of gratitude to our friends here at the French Embassy in Ireland for their uh, fantastic collaboration in organizing today's events. Indeed, this is the second conference on climate and sustainability, which the IIEA and the Embassy have co-convened. Uh, today's conference is sought to highlight the important contribution that various communities can make in pursuit of a more sustainable and decarbonized future. And we heard from uh, the policy community, the business community, UN representatives, thought leaders, and voices from a younger generation, all of whom recognized that addressing the climate and environmental crisis requires cross-community engagement. These uh, perspectives in their totality are most timely and inspirational given the, uh, the major UN COP26, uh, which as you all know, takes place in Glasgow in November. And they also have to highlight our partnership and shared uh, Franco-Irish climate ambition at both the EU level, as France prepares to assume the presidency of the Council of the European Union next year, and at the UN level, where in 2022, France and Ireland will be the only EU member states on the UN Security Council. So with that, again, I'd like to thank the French Embassy for co-organizing this conference with us, with the IAEA, our speakers and moderators from all three sessions, and indeed you, our audience, for your sustained uh, interest and engagement throughout and the questions that you've asked our many panelists. Um, in these weeks, we at the IAEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs, are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Uh, and it's all the more gratifying to have co-hosted this event focusing on uh, sustaining our future. And when we mark the next milestone of the, IAEA's, of the IAEA's history, I hope that we can look back with some pride at the contribution uh, that for its part, the Institute has made in addressing this most vital issue of our times. And as I close this conference, I do so looking forward to future Franco-Irish uh, engagement on the role for all communities in the transition to a climate resilient and sustainable future. And also, it would be very remiss of me not to just extend a warm thank you to the team who made today's event uh, possible. Indeed, the teams that made today's event possible, both in the Institute and in the, uh, the French Embassy, who developed this initiative and made it all happen today. So with that, to all of you, uh, to on my screen, Ina and Orla, and to you, Sinead, but to everybody uh, participating throughout this morning's session, it was truly a, a timely event and also more importantly, an inspirational one. Thank you all very much indeed and good day.